Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mark Lippman. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences here at IPFW. I want to welcome you to the School of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Lecture or Series, a series of lectures that began in 1982 and has continued with one or two of these ever since, part of our outreach efforts in the community, our effort to connect what we do in the classroom with community interests. We have a very interesting talk this evening, and to introduce our speaker from the Department of Communication, Professor Richard Hess. By way of introducing David Zarefsky, we're going to talk a little bit about the School of Arts and Sciences. We do a fall lecture with a distinguished lecturer of national and international repute from outside the campus. We do a spring lecture with one of our own who is equally well qualified. Our school is involved in the areas of humanities, social science, and science. And by way of introducing David, I'd like to do it through the filter of popular culture, specifically two movies. Last Sunday evening on PBS, there was a movie that was a new version of Mr. Chips. And it is a story of a teacher in a boys or a men's school at the turn of the 20th century. And he is one who, through humane teaching, sets an example and is loved and admired by all of his students. David Zaretsky has been nominated by the Northwestern Students' Government to the university's honor roll of teaching on 12 different occasions during his career. In 2001, the movie A Beautiful Mind, about John Nash, the 1994 <clears throat> Nobel Prize winner in economics, told the story of Professor Nash a mathematician uh, who suffered a mental illness. As a student at Princeton and his professional career, and also as a professor at Princeton. The thing I want to call your attention to is the two dramatic climaxes, at least for me, in that movie. One comes when he's a student, and that climax is when he is uh, competing with his fellow students uh, for a prestigious appointment. And he's taken to the faculty club by the chair of the math department. And he's told that he hasn't done sufficient work to merit being uh, not, uh, given that particular award. But while he's at the faculty club, he witnesses various faculty members walking to the table of a distinguished colleague and presenting, each one presenting that colleague a pen. And the chair says it's the presentation of a pen award, a fountain pen. And that it is a capstone of a professional career of significant achievement. Later in the film, when he has suffered greatly and he's back at Princeton. A uh, representative of the Nobel Committee goes to Princeton to check him out, to see if he will withstand the pressure of receiving the award. And he takes him to the faculty club. And at the faculty club, Nash is very reluctant to enter. He says that he usually takes his lunch in the library in large measure because of the earlier bad memories. 
And as he's seated there, all of his colleagues walk over and each presents him with a fountain pen acknowledging his achievement. David Zareski is an individual that I've known professionally for 35 years. He has been an outstanding debate coach. In fact, he probably could get in trouble in any city in the country and have one of his alums as a lawyer represent him. <laughs> he has received distinguished uh, recognition by professional societies for books that he has written uh, and they're spelled out in your program. It is IPFW's Faculty of Arts and Sciences honor to, if you will, present our fountain pen to David Zareski and ask him to address us this evening on the topic Texas annexation and slavery, the fatal mix of politics and rhetoric. David? Thank you very much, Dick, for that wonderful introduction. I have never been compared with either Mr. Chips or John Nash before, so I was anxious to see just how you were going to do that, but I'm, I'm very appreciative. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm certainly honored uh, to join the list of people that have been invited to IPFW as part of this distinguished lecturer series. I've been looking forward to it for some time now, and. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see all of you here this evening. So Dean Lippman, ladies and gentlemen, everybody knew, as Abraham Lincoln put it in his second inaugural address, that the interest represented by slavery was somehow the cause of the Civil War. But how? And why, after 80 years of compromise with the peculiar institution, did the nation divide over this issue in 1860? Until about the time of the American Revolution, slavery was not controversial in either the North or the South. Indeed, what slavery meant in civic discourse was not the ownership of one person by another, but a political relationship characterized by the dependence of one community on another. Now, as colonists began to draw analogies between the political relationship they were trying to dislodge and the personal relationship they were willing to maintain, slavery did become a contested issue. But it was a political issue, like any other, subject to log rolling and compromise for the greater good of the Union. When, why, and how did the nature of the issue change into an overarching question that could be settled only by war? The claim I want to explore with you tonight is that a pivotal turning point came when the issue of slavery was joined with the issue of territorial expansion. This was a fatal mix, and it occurred during the early 1840s as the nation contemplated the annexation of Texas. The mixing of the issues refigured the slavery debate. It was no longer a matter of whether South Carolinians could have slaves if they so chose, but instead was a question of whether the virgin lands of the West, the lands that belong to the whole country, would become free or slave. For most of the early 19th century, politicians scrupulously avoided mixing these two issues. The Missouri Compromise controversy of 1819 and 1820 exposed how volatile the slavery issue could be. Thomas Jefferson referred to it as the fire bell in the night. For the next 20 years, politicians had a common interest in keeping it off the table. Only two new states, Arkansas and Michigan, one slave and one free, were admitted during this whole period. 
Andrew Jackson stifled his urge to aid the Republic of Texas, delaying even the grant of diplomatic recognition until his last day in office. Abolitionists were despised by mainstream politicians, not because those politicians were pro-slavery, but because they feared for the future if the genie were let out of the bottle. Colonization of freed blacks in Africa, which many even then regarded as an utterly impractical scheme, was championed as a serious proposal because it was such an elegant solution to the problems of slavery and race at the same time. The gag rule, according to which the U.S. House of Representatives refused to receive petitions on slavery, an action we remember as an egregious violation of the First Amendment right to petition, was prompted by the desire to keep this inflammatory subject off the agenda of public discussion. Fearful of what people would say or how the controversy could escalate, leading politicians hoped to keep it off the radar screen of the public forum. It's not that Whigs and Democrats were blind to the issue. Rather, they based their silence in the hope that the country would outgrow it somehow. Democrats would have the country outgrow it by enlarging territory and population so that the issue would be seen as trivial. Whigs would outgrow it by economic development that would make slavery unprofitable and cause it to die of its own accord. Both parties hoped for the day when the issue would recede in significance and the institution would collapse of its own weight and when both slavery and the slaves themselves would somehow disappear. Meanwhile, it was better not to upset these long-term historical forces by raising such a divisive and contentious issue. And so, like Social Security in the 1990s, slavery became the third rail of American politics. People would not touch it lest they die. All this changed in the early 1840s when the administration of John Tyler proposed to annex the Republic of Texas. Texas had been a Mexican province largely settled by U.S. nationals living under very loose Mexican rule. When Mexico sought to tighten control of the provinces, among other reasons in order to enforce Mexican law outlawing slavery, the Texans revolted. After the Battle of San Jacinto, they forced the captured Mexican president, Santa Ana, to recognize the independence of Texas, a republic whose geographic boundaries were completely undefined. Mexico soon reneged on this recognition. After all, it was extracted under duress and threatened to restart the war. That placed the admittedly weak Republic of Texas in search of friendly allies. When the initial bid for U.S. annexation was rejected, Texas explored the option of seeking economic and political protection from one or more nations of Europe, particularly England. And that was a danger that led the U.S. government to reassess its position. Fear of English influence to the Southwest as well as the North and Northwest was only one of the factors, however, leading Tyler toward annexation. Another was a growing emotional tide in favor of territorial expansion. The argument that a republic could not survive a vast geographic area had been given the lie by the Louisiana Purchase and would be rendered even more obsolete with the technological advance of the railroad and the telegraph. The phrase manifest destiny would be coined in 1845 but the sentiment was already there, championed especially by Democrats from the old Northwest, from states like Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, who wanted to invade Canada and force a war with Britain. Michigan alone boasted its Congressman Chipman would conquer Canada in 90 days, give it up, and conquer it again in 90 more. Related to geographic expansion was the sense that a growing economy 
required an expansion of its markets. The Tyler administration witnessed efforts to open the markets of China and Japan. Texas offered another opportunity, one closer to home. And then there was the peculiar political situation of President Tyler himself. An anti-Jackson Democrat, he had been placed on the 1840 Whig ticket along with William Henry Harrison in a pitch for the united support of Southerners opposed to Jackson. When the hero of Tippecanoe died after one month in office, the nation had not only its first unelected president, but one whose principles differed greatly from those of his predecessor. Wishful thinking that Tyler might tailor his policies to Harrison's were, was dashed when he vetoed Whig-sponsored bills to recharter the Bank of the United States. His cabinet, except for Daniel Webster, resigned en masse, and he was publicly read out of the Whig party. But as an apostate, he was no more welcome among the Democrats, who seemed determined to offer former President Martin Van Buren the opportunity to avenge his 1840 defeat for re-election. As Tyler saw it, his political future depended on his running as an independent and trumping both of the parties. But to do that, he needed a signature issue. And he found it, he thought, in the annexation of Texas. Where Jackson and Van Buren held back, he would go forward, not only saving his political future, but building his place in history. Finally, among the reasons prompting renewed interest in annexation was a particular fear some Southerners held about what Britain might do. The British Empire, including the West Indies, had abolished slavery in 1832. They paid a price because without slave labor, the British West Indies could no longer sell cotton as cheaply to manufacturers abroad. So it would be in Britain's interest now to induce others to abolish slavery too, so that Britain could regain a level playing field. Anxious Southerners thought they saw the outlines of a deal. Britain would pressure Mexico with the incentive of commercial advantages to recognize Texas independence and abandon efforts at reconquest. In return, Texas would develop commercial ties to Britain and would abolish slavery. The prospect of a free Texas on our own southwestern border, as these southerners saw it, would be a magnet for runaway slaves from the American South a clearly unacceptable prospect because it threatened to undermine the peculiar institution itself. So this complex of factors, antipathy to Britain and her influence, incipient manifest destiny, the desire for new markets, Tyler's precarious political position, and the fear of a plot to abolish slavery, explains the willingness of politicians now in the early 1840s to take the risk of touching the then third rail of politics by proposing to annex the Republic of Texas. It wasn't that others weren't warning against it, however. The abolitionist Benjamin Lundy alleged as early as 1836 that the Texas Revolution was instigated by Americans as part of a plan to bring Texas into the Union and extend slavery, a charge of conspiracy for which there was no valid evidence. Former President John Quincy Adams, who served in the House of Representatives for 18 years after his defeat at the hands of Andrew Jackson, delivered several speeches in the early 1840s in which he warned his constituents and by extension other Northern Whigs of the dangers of Texas annexation and darkly hinted that it was part of a plot to extend the political influence of slavery's defenders. But people like Lundy and John Quincy Adams could be dismissed as fanatics. Tyler proceeded cautiously at first. In the fall of 1841, 
He suggested to Secretary of State Daniel Webster that annexation would be a worthy goal if it could be accomplished by treaty and without Mexico's opposition. Webster strongly opposed annexation, a position from which he never wavered. And when it became apparent that Tyler wanted to proceed, Webster too resigned from the cabinet. His successor, Abel P. Upshur of Virginia, was a committed annexationist. Tyler distrusted the American minister to London, Edward Everett, because he was a Whig and thus beholden to Henry Clay. And so when Everett said Britain isn't plotting anything, Tyler didn't trust him. So he and Upshur sent their own emissary, Duff Green, ostensibly to help in negotiating commercial treaties, but also to keep an eye on any discussions between the British and the Republic of Texas. While in London, Green became privy to some unusual information that he reported back to Upshur, who shared it not only with Tyler, but also with John C. Calhoun, whom Upshur hoped would succeed to the presidency. It seems that a Texas abolitionist, if you can imagine such a thing, on his own had gone to London to arrange just such a deal as I described above. Texas officials made very clear to their London counterparts that this man, Stephen Pearl Andrews, spoke only for himself and that he did not have their support. His scheme, as you might suppose, came to naught, although British officials did indicate that they hoped that Texas and all the world eventually would come to abolish slavery. Everett assured the administration there was nothing to rumors of a plot. So did the British minister to the United States, Richard Pakenham, who wrote a letter to Upshur renouncing any such plot. That letter, however, went unanswered because it arrived just before Secretary Upshur's untimely death from an explosion aboard the USS Princeton, a new warship that he was touring. But Tyler was influenced more by the report from his friend Duff Green, who, unconstrained by either healthy skepticism or good judgment, reported the rumors of conspiracy as though they were fact. These events then set the stage for the emergence of Texas annexation as an issue in 1844 intertwined with the question of slavery. But its emergence would not have been predicted by the leadership of the two major parties. The Democrats, as I mentioned, had Martin Van Buren far out in front of a group of challengers, and the Whigs seemed set to offer a third chance at the presidency to their leader, Henry Clay. Neither Van Buren nor Clay supported annexation although it wouldn't be fair to say that either was unalterably opposed. After all, Clay, while Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams, had tried unsuccessfully to buy Texas from Mexico, and Van Buren was part of the Jackson administration that had attempted the same. But neither man saw Texas annexation as expedient in 1844. It would distract attention from other issues, and as Jackson and Van Buren had foreseen, it was a volatile issue whose trajectory was unpredictable. Van Buren and Clay actually met at Clay's home in 1842 to discuss the issue. Although the record is not conclusive, many historians believe that they agreed as Roosevelt and Wilkie did with the war in 1940, or Johnson and Goldwater with Vietnam in 1964, to keep the issue out of the presidential campaign. They both came out against annexation, and they both came out on the same day, April 27, 1844. 
It was not thought seemly at this time for presidential candidates to campaign directly for office. As in academe, to seek out the office was prima facie grounds for disqualification. By 1844, however, the custom had developed of writing letters to a friend or supporter who in turn would cause them to be published in the newspaper so that people could find out the candidate's views on an issue. Van Buren wrote such a letter on April 20 from his home in Lindenwald, New York, to Congressman W. H. Hammett, who had it published in the Washington Globe on April 27th. Let me tell you a few things about this document. The first thing one notices about Van Buren's eight-page letter is that it is indirect and equivocal. The first half of the letter almost reads like a brief for annexation. Van Buren recounts the earlier history of efforts to purchase Texas and states that Congress has the constitutional power to admit new states and territories, and he observes that sympathies naturally draw us to the Texas cause. Midway through the letter, however, he switches focus and alleges that immediate annexation, while constitutional, would be inexpedient. Note the qualifiers. Note his stress on immediate annexation and his grounding of his position in the value of expediency. The unstated implication is that annexation at another time might be expedient and that if so there would be no legal or constitutional objection to it. But why would immediate annexation be inexpedient? Van Buren offers two reasons. It would mean waging an aggressive war against Mexico and it was proposed secretly without adequate consultation of the American people. The first of these reasons is based on the fact that Mexico no longer recognized the independence of Texas. It had reneged on its recognition and hence denies the competence of Texas to negotiate with the United States. If Texas had no standing to speak on its own behalf, then Mexico in effect would have a veto over any American annexation effort unless we wish to assume the burden of an unjustified aggressive war against Mexico. And clearly Van Buren did not. And yet he didn't want to close the door altogether. His second and more substantial argument addressed this matter. He noted that many favored, as he called it, the re-annexation of Texas, and he appealed to the ethos of Andrew Jackson, but he also noted that the proposal had received little support in either House of Congress and hence could not be assumed to represent the wish of the majority of the population. And so unless that condition were to change, he was opposed to annexation. Acknowledging that some would be uncomfortable, that he could not pledge in advance what he would do, he nonetheless asserts that his course is the prudent one to take. Now notice what Van Buren does not argue in this letter. He never mentioned slavery. In fact, he doesn't engage the claims of annexation proponents at all except for the fear of British influence that would make Texas a colony or a dependency. And that, he says, he does not believe. For good measure, Van Buren added that should he be proved wrong, then we could act in self-defense. So little credence did he give to the rumors, however, that he did not discuss them further. That's Van Buren's letter. The same day that the Globe published that letter, another newspaper, the National Intelligencer, published one from Henry Clay. He had written it on April 17 in Raleigh, North Carolina, near the conclusion of a southern tour on which he found pro-Texas sentiment less than overwhelming. He said he had delayed until now offering his opinion because he didn't think it proper unnecessarily to introduce a new element among the other exciting subjects which agitate and engross the public. Moreover, he could not imagine that any president 
would venture upon so grave and momentous a proceeding in direct opposition to strong and decided expressions of public disapprobation. But, he noted wryly, it appears I was mistaken. Like Van Buren, Clay was not unalterably opposed to annexation. The question would assume a very different form, he said, if it were presented without the loss of national character, without the hazard of foreign war, with the general concurrence of the nation, without any danger to the integrity of the Union, and without giving an unreasonable price for Texas. Those were his conditions. After reviewing recent history, he concluded that none of those conditions obtained. Like Van Buren, he offered two principal arguments. Since Mexico had not abandoned her claims to Texas, our action would necessarily bring us to war against Mexico. And second, Clay argued annexation would be divisive. Texas, he said, should not come into the Union in decided opposition to the wishes of a considerable and respectable portion of the Confederacy. I think it far more wise and important, he added, to compose and harmonize the present Confederacy as it now exists than to introduce a new element of discord and distraction into it. Clay was especially troubled that some were arguing for or against Texas on the basis that it would give a special advantage to the South. This, Clay believed, was the worst possible motive for annexation because such a principle put into practical operation would menace the existence of the Union. What made it even worse, he thought, was that Texas probably wouldn't really strengthen the South. Like Van Buren, Clay gave little credence to the English threats, noting that Great Britain has recently formally and solemnly disavowed any such aims and purposes. A disavowal and declaration he noted that, I presume, are in the possession of the executive, meaning Tyler. So a surface assessment of the Van Buren and Clay letters was that they reached similar conclusions for similar reasons. Moreover, the similarity in positions by the two presumptive candidates meant that Texas would not be an issue in the forthcoming presidential election. It would be closed off before Tyler might have a chance to rally support. Or so it seemed. Now in the same week in April that Clay and Van Buren wrote their letters, Tyler sent to the Senate the draft of an annexation treaty accompanied by a message. This was the culmination effort of a concerted public relations effort that had begun months before with the publication in pamphlet form of a letter by Mississippi Senator Robert Walker, a Tyler ally that reached a large public audience. Walker's pattern of argument was followed closely in Tyler's message. Put briefly, Tyler's overall strategy was first to establish that every section of the country would benefit from annexation, and second, to plead that the urgency of the situation required immediate action. He sought in this way to transcend both sectionalism and politics as usual, and to secure a quick result before Van Buren and Clay could take over in the presidential election campaign. In his message, Tyler began by asserting that his motive was the general good of the whole people. Since most of the settlers of Texas were Americans, they would bring to that new land the principles of civil liberty. Moreover, Texas enjoys a healthy climate, fertile soil, and a future of commercial advantage. These are all matters of universal benefit. And then Tyler went on to enumerate benefits to the North and Middle States, benefits to the West, and benefits to the South. The North and Middle States would gain new markets for manufactured goods. For the West, there would be markets for beef, pork, horses, mules, etc. 
And what of the South? She would gain protection of her peace and tranquility against all efforts to disturb them, whether foreign or domestic. Translation, the South need not fear a free Texas on its borders to attract fugitive slaves and to lobby for abolition. On this point, Walker's pamphlet had gone even further and had made the ingenious argument that since the international slave trade had been abolished, the slaves attracted to Texas would have to come from the less fertile soil of the Upper South, depleting the slave population there and making it more likely that the Upper South would abolish slavery, just as the Middle States and New England had done some 40 years before. This ingenious, if dubious, argument allowed Walker simultaneously to assure the South that the annexation of Texas would promote the spread of slavery and to imply to the North that annexation would hasten the demise of slavery. Perhaps figuring that this two-faced posture strained credulity, Tyler did not pick it up in his message. He satisfied himself by offering markets to the North and West, peace and safety to the South. Tyler shifted to his second strategy by contending that all the sectional benefits, though real, were secondary to Texas's real need for protection. Mexico continues to threaten Texas, he said, so the Republic of Texas must get help from a strong partner. If we reject Texas, she will look elsewhere, with consequences to the U.S. of loss of revenue, needless military expenditure, escalation of tensions, and threats from whomever Texas might pick as its allies. Annexation offers the last best hope to avert these international calamities. The claim of urgency not only justifies haste, but trumps such procedural arguments as those advanced by Van Buren and Clay about who ought to be consulted with. They might have preferred more extensive discussion but the situation doesn't afford such luxury. As for the fears Clay and Van Buren had expressed about war with Mexico, Tyler said, Mexico has nothing to worry about because no other power will be threatened by American action confined to Texas alone. Now, if you've been following along with me, you've noticed that Van Buren Clay and Tyler all treated the subject of slavery gingerly. Not so the fourth and final key letter writer in April of 1844. And this is what will thicken the plot. As you recall, Secretary of State Upshur died in a tragic accident in February before he could answer the letter from Minister Pakenham. His successor, appointed by Tyler under some duress, was John C. Calhoun. Not only was Calhoun a political rival for Tyler, but he was fiercely independent and not disposed to follow other people's instructions. Calhoun finished out the treaty negotiations with Texas for annexation, still conducted officially in secret, and completed them on April 12. But before Tyler sent the treaty to Congress, Calhoun on April 18 replied to the unanswered letter from Pakenham that had been sent to Upshur weeks before and he included his reply to Pakenham in the pile of documents that Tyler sent to Congress along with the treaty. Pakenham, as we remember, wrote to assure the American government against any British intervention in the internal affairs of the U.S., even while repeating that Her Majesty's government desired the end of slavery everywhere in the world and was constantly exerting herself to bring about such a result. 
Now, in context, the reference to constantly exerting herself probably was a rhetorical flourish to express the sincerity of Britain's commitment to the anti-slavery cause. But Calhoun took it literally as evidence of active and continuous meddling by Britain giving the lie to her protestations of non-interference, proving Duff Green correct, and justifying a peremptory American response. George W. Bush did not invent the doctrine of preemption. The construction of Calhoun's reply to Pakenham is worth careful attention. After observing that British anti-slavery efforts confined to her own colonies and possessions were her own business, he added, but when she goes beyond and avows it as her settled policy and the object of her constant exertions to abolish it throughout the world, she makes it the duty of all other countries whose safety or prosperity may be endangered by her policy to adopt such measures as they deem necessary for their protection. Now please notice several features of this rhetorical construction that I've just quoted. First, Calhoun assumes that if Britain were actively lobbying for abolition in Texas, that advocacy would endanger the safety or prosperity of the United States, and hence would be a cause for action. Second. The proof that Britain would lobby in this way is not found in any overt actions, but in Pakenham's reference to constant exertions and the statement that Britain hoped to see slavery ended in Texas and everywhere. Third, the American response is positioned as a duty, a responsibility thrust upon us by the situation notwithstanding the fact that Tyler had actively sought annexation for almost three years. Fourth, annexation is characterized not as a means to the national economic and social benefits identified by Tyler, but solely as a measure of self-defense to thwart the British anti-slavery design, a design that would pressure Texas to abolish slavery exposing the weakest and most vulnerable part of the U.S. frontier to inroads and giving Britain the power to effect abolition in neighboring states. So for Calhoun, Texas annexation was justified entirely as a means to protect and extend the slavery interest. Moving beyond the assertion that Britain was meddling in others' business, the Secretary of State first argued that Britain must respect the right of every American state to decide its own domestic institutions. And then, not willing himself to leave each state alone, proceeded to, argue, to urge those states that had retained slavery not to give it up. Now remember, this is all in a letter that's part of diplomatic correspondence, that Calhoun is urging the slave states to keep slavery. Citing defective statistics from the 1840 census, Calhoun emphasized that the condition of slaves was far better than that of free blacks. This statistical evidence only underscored what experience had taught, he said, that the current race relations in the slaveholding states benefit both races. To protect that institution against whatever might endanger it, the United States had now concluded a treaty with Texas for the annexation of the Lone Star Republic. And remember that Calhoun not only wrote this letter to Pakenham, he put a copy of it in the pile of materials that went to every member of Congress along with Tyler's message and with the treaty. Calhoun's letter to Pakenham is a remarkable document and it has spawned considerable speculation about why he wrote it and why he sent it to Congress. Some have even speculated counterintuitively that Calhoun wanted to sabotage the treaty because doing so might either enhance his political prospects 
or the likelihood of Southern secession from the Union. Others have suggested that his motive was to warn the British not to deal with rogue diplomats like Andrews or to mask the fact that the real British threat was commercial. Still others have surmised that Calhoun's main goal was to undermine Van Buren by staking out a position on Texas that the Democratic frontrunner could not possibly endorse. Without entering into the thicket of all of these speculations, I think there is a more straightforward explanation. Unlike Upshur, Calhoun doubted with good reason that there were enough votes in the Senate to ratify the annexation treaty. Hoping to attract a united Southern vote from both Whigs and Democrats, he placed the treaty within a frame of reference, within a rhetorical construction that he thought would be most appealing to the South. It gets even more convoluted. Each one of these four documents, Van Buren's and Clay's public letters, Tyler's message to Congress, and Calhoun's reply to Pakenham, would alter the landscape of the 1844 presidential campaign and of history in ways that its author could not predict. Calhoun's appeal failed, at least in the short run. Leading politicians immediately saw that he had blundered in justifying annexation on pro-slavery grounds, and they wrote letters to each other asking what in the world he possibly could be thinking to do that. Despite his efforts, in June of 1844, Southerners in Congress voted mostly along party lines, Democrats for the Texas Treaty and Whigs against. But the blatant pro-slavery appeal of Calhoun's letter did help to unite Northerners against the treaty, which the Senate defeated by a vote of 35 to 16. Undaunted, Taylor replied that annexation didn't really require a treaty anyway. Taking advantage of constitutional ambiguity on this point, he promptly resubmitted the defeated treaty as a joint resolution to both houses of Congress. As you know from Civics I, treaties required a two-thirds vote of the Senate, whereas a joint resolution required only a simple majority of each house. Congress decided, however, to defer further action until after the election, and so the matter waited. Thus Calhoun. Whatever response Van Buren's letter might have received in general, it severely antagonized one very influential member of his audience, former President Andrew Jackson. Now in retirement at the Hermitage, but undiminished in his hatred for the British since the Battle of New Orleans. In 1843, Jackson had sent a letter to a Tennessee congressman urging annexation in order to defend against the British threat, which he, of course, saw as a matter of geopolitics, not of slavery, and which he thought was quite real. Until now, that letter had not been released. It had not been made public. Jackson now authorized its publication and added another emphasizing the urgency of the matter. This led him to break with his own protege, Martin Van Buren. After he read Van Buren's letter, he concluded that anybody who wrote that must be so out of touch with the issues that he couldn't possibly get the Democratic nomination. And behind the scenes, Jackson encouraged the efforts of a group of Democrats to manipulate the convention rules in order to stop Van Buren and give the nomination instead to the man who would have been Van Buren's running mate, Jackson's fellow Tennessean, James K. Polk, a strong supporter of Texas annexation. Now, with the Democratic nomination going to Polk rather than Van Buren, the case for Tyler's independent candidacy quickly fizzled. Clearly, the Texas question was not going to be frozen out of the campaign. It was a central difference between Polk and Clay. 
Concerned lest the pro-Texas vote be divided, the Polk and Tyler campaigns negotiated Tyler's withdrawal in favor of Polk in return for pledges that Tyler's supporters would not be punished when it came to the patronage to be dispensed by a Polk administration. Jackson was right about one thing. Public opinion in the South was moving perceptibly in favor of annexation. If Calhoun failed in the short run, his strategy triumphed over time. And this fact created a big problem for the Whig nominee, Henry Clay. No longer protected against having the Texas issue raised during the campaign, Clay now believed that his Raleigh letter made him vulnerable among Southern Whigs. For them, it would be only a matter of time before region took precedence over party. So to shore up his position, he wrote more letters. In July, he sent two of them to supporters in Alabama. In these letters, Clay said that he personally had no objection to the annexation of Texas if it could be achieved without dishonor, without war, with the common consent of the Union, and upon just and fair terms. At the same time, he made clear, I do not think the subject of slavery ought to affect the question one way or the other. His reason was that slavery was destined for extinction anyway, so it would be unwise to refuse a permanent acquisition on account of a temporary institution. But it was easy for people to misconstrue Clay's statement as trivializing the very issue that troubled so many in the North. And so now Clay was concerned that he might be stirring up a backlash in the North. And so he wrote more letters claiming that what he said in Alabama was consistent with what he had said in Raleigh. Finally, after reaffirming that he thought his positions perfectly consistent, he announced that he would make no more public statements about this matter. (laughs) This series of Clay letters can only be described as rhetorical blunders. Southern Whigs, who were considering bolting the party, would see through Clay's statement that he would be in favor of annexation if it could be achieved by common consent and without war. These were impossible conditions, and Clay's offer had all the earmarks of an empty gesture. At the same time, some Northerners who were unhappy with Clay's statement that slavery shouldn't decide the matter, reconsidered their support, and they had a place to go. They could support the Reverend James G. Burney, a Ralph Nader type candidate of the Liberty Party, a party that attracted support from abolitionists and other extreme anti-slavery forces. A vote for Burney would come much more at Clay's expense than Polk's. Burney's supporters concern was that Clay, who after all was a slave owner himself, was not at all strong enough for the anti-slavery cause. Now hopefully we see the convoluted nature of this election as it developed. About the election itself, let me note just a few interesting facts. The result was not known for several days after the voting was concluded. It turned on the outcome in a single large state where the vote was very close. The candidate from Tennessee lost his home state. But that candidate, Polk, won the election because Bernie took just enough votes in New York, mostly at Clay's expense, to throw its 36 electoral votes to Polk. Bernie had 15,000 votes in New York. Polk carried the state by 5,000, and with it, he won the election. He defeated Clay 170 electoral votes to 105. 
Now you can do the math, subtract 36 from one, add 36 to the other, and you get a different result. But even here, the story does not end. Notwithstanding the manner of Polk's victory, that is, Polk won because Clay wasn't anti-slavery enough for this fringe element in New York, Tyler repeatedly and insistently proclaimed that the election results were a clear mandate for immediate annexation. He therefore implored Congress to take up and pass the joint resolution that had lain on the table since summer. There followed a whole new congressional debate over the constitutionality and expediency of Tyler's proposal. Although the Whigs were demoralized, dispirited, and disorganized after the election, they rallied and the two houses of Congress reached an impasse. The House favored admitting Texas by joint resolution. The Senate, jealous of its prerogatives, voted instead to recommend renegotiating the treaty. Senator Walker in the Compromise Committee broke the deadlock in an ingenious way. He urged Congress to pass both proposals and let the President, meaning the incoming President Polk, choose between them. Congress did so, though narrowly, by a 27 to 25 vote in the Senate. But they acted just a little bit too fast. The congressional action reached the President on March the 1st. The President on March the 1st was Tyler, because Inauguration Day was March the 4th. Having no last-minute pardon business to attend to, <laughs> Tyler and Calhoun counseled between themselves and concluded that it would take the incoming Polk administration time to get settled in and to study the matter, and the issue was urgent and could not wait. So Tyler, using the President's prerogative that had been intended for Polk, chose the joint resolution rather than renegotiating the treaty, and sent a messenger to Texas on March the 3rd to announce that an annexation resolution had passed. Texas considered the matter at a convention called for July the 4th. It gave its assent, and in December of 1845, Texas became the 28th state. Congress, meanwhile, had admitted Florida to statehood. To balance the new slave states, in short order, Congress admitted the new free states of Iowa and Wisconsin. Now, beyond this tale of the 1844 campaign, I want to end by noting that the way the slavery issue was constructed in that campaign, particularly as a result of the Calhoun-Packenham exchange, had at least two long-term consequences. First, it gave new meaning to the term slave power. The term had been in use for many years, referring to the congressional and electoral advantage that the slave states enjoyed from the extra representatives and electors they got as a result of the three-fifths clause in the Constitution. And in fact, their analyses of how many of the Southern presidents were elected only because of that reason. That's what slave power meant. Only fanatics such as John Quincy Adams alleged that slavery's defenders were actively plotting and conspiring to extend the domain of the peculiar institution. But the Texas controversy, and especially Calhoun's letter, gave that view credence, and it caused slave power to identify not just a mathematical quirk in the Constitution, but an active plan and design by supporters of slavery to extend its influence. It did appear that plotters were at work, and when sinister and conspiratorial forces are operating, one cannot be too careful or vigilant. The allegation of conspiracy, of course, raises the temperature of the discourse and renders compromise more difficult. After all, one does not collaborate with the devil. 
When the charge of conspiracy was made in later years by Salmon P. Chase, Abraham Lincoln, and others, a steady stream of confirming evidence could be found starting with the actions of those who brought about the annexation of Texas. So that was one long-term consequence, that the way the slavery issue and the annexation issue were brought together made this charge of a slave power conspiracy seem credible. Second, raising the slavery issue in the context of territorial expansion proved especially volatile. After Texas came in, President Polk sent General Zachary Taylor to occupy land that Texas claimed but did not control between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande. The resulting skirmish with Mexican forces began the Mexican War. Scarcely four months into the war, Pennsylvania Congressman David Wilmot introduced his proviso that no territory to be acquired from Mexico would be open to slavery. It was the Texas controversy that had raised the salience of the issue. Heated discussion of the Wilmot proviso ensued over the years. It fundamentally changed the debate from one about whether the institution of slavery would survive, a debate that abolitionists couldn't win, to one about whether it would be allowed to grow, which gave new life to the anti-slavery cause. By focusing on the extension of slavery, anti-slavery forces could attract to their cause both those who thought slavery wrong because it denied the humanity of African Americans and those who wanted slavery kept out of the territories because they wanted blacks kept out of the territories. High principle and naked self-interest. Politics makes strange bedfellows. Limiting the extension of slavery was the platform of the Free Soil Party of 1848 and it became the centerpiece of the Republican Party during the 1850s. It was the horse on which Lincoln rode to the White House. And seeing the limitation of slavery as the first step toward its outright abolition was the specter that South Carolina and six other states in 1860 would see as sufficient cause to dissolve the Union. Now don't get me wrong, I don't mean to suggest that this chain of events was inevitable. The very idea of seeing reality as a product of frames of reference and rhetorical constructions eschews law-like inevitability. But rhetoric has trajectories. It leads us in certain directions. The Texas controversy was captured in discourse that had tendencies destructive of sustaining national feeling and goodwill. <coughs> Texas was brought to the table in a way that heightened sectionalism, heightened suspiciousness and distrust, and reduced the maneuvering room for compromise. It is in this sense that the year 1844 was a pivotal moment in which public discourse started down the path that would lead to civil war. consented to take a question or two after he washes down that lecture a little bit <laughs> So, questions? No questions because they're still all in. Yeah. 
Well, I have one. What would have been, say, the first reasonable place for compromise to have come back into the discourse that might have averted that, that path to the Civil War? You mean once Texas was annexed? Once Texas was already annexed, and so that you know we we've started down that path yeah. of, of unhappiness and mistrust. Was there a place where someone could have stepped up and undone it? Yes. One of the provisions of the treaty and then the resolution for annexation, that's a, a very curious provision, is that Texas had the right on its own initiative to divide itself up into as many as five states. I believe they still have that power, although nobody has proposed that it be exercised. It seems to me that the first point at which compromise could have come back in would have been for Texas to divide itself into an even number of states, either two or four, half of them slave and the other half free, and thereby not only continue the equality of states, but also seemingly give the lie to the allegation that this is all part of a, of a plot. Uh, and given the, given the magnitude of the area that the Republic of Texas was claiming, it was not only the present boundaries of Texas, but it followed the Rio Grande all the way up to its source, so all of eastern, what's now eastern New Mexico and some of eastern Colorado, and it went up northward claiming Oklahoma and part of Kansas and Wyoming, uh, if, you, if you imagined taking all of that area and dividing it up into states, the odds are very good that you would not have had all slave states. So that's, I mean, that's a place that compromise could have come in. But of course, the argument that Calhoun has laid out, that we ought to annex Texas in order to protect the slaveholding interest, would make that kind of a compromise much more difficult to swallow than it otherwise would have been. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if this is correct, but it seemed like both Mexico and Great Britain at the time were talking heavily of trying to get Texas into an independent state. So when the, uh, the Americans and the United States decided to annex, I mean, they just decided to throw their hands up and, and go back to their own uh, squadron, or, or did, was there any other, uh, I don't know, interaction or even duress of both Mexico and Britain about annexation? That's a very good question. By they, you mean Texas, right? Yes. Or Texas or uh, uh, it, there, there was a very interesting dance that was taking place during these years uh, but, uh, involving the Republic of Texas, Mexico, Britain, and the U.S. And essentially, as soon as the U.S. seemed to be very interested in annexation, the Republic of Texas would back off and say, well, you know, we're not so sure. Maybe we'll be better off if we make this commercial deal with Britain. Or maybe we'll be better off if we negotiate with Mexico and somehow or other get Mexico to finally recognize our independence. Um, the, the key figure there was Sam Houston. And if you know anything about Sam Houston, who was the president for much of this time of the Republic of Texas, he was a very crafty individual. And so there was a fair amount of playing off the US, Mexico, and Britain against one another that the Republic of Texas was engaged in. And part of what was motivating Tyler to push for annexation was to gain the upper hand in that and put an end to it and assert uh, the, the American interest. Now, at the time that the, uh, that the Congress finally voted for annexation, the Republic of Texas was in pretty dire financial straits and they reached the conclusion that this was probably the best arrangement that they were going to get. But you're, but you're absolutely right in suggesting that all of those countries were players. And that's, I mean, that's part of what made this whole controversy so interesting, is that it wasn't taking place just as a domestic dispute in the U.S. Congress. It was also a matter of extensive diplomatic maneuvering. Then let me thank Dr. Zarevsky once again. Thank you. Thank you.